Hey there, all you Legionnaires, and welcome to a very special episode of whatever this is, uh, a Legion podcast ex- exclusive. So, uh, Midnight Mass, the Mike Flanagan series, is now out on Netflix. It is a seven episode run, and I binge that thing something fierce uh, over the course of a couple of days and have been dying to talk about it ever since. And fortunately for me and you, the listeners, also having binged that show are Brian and Jamie Sammons of the Horror House of Sammons. And so we sat down to have an extended conversation about Midnight Mass. So fair warning, uh, we will spoil things, but only after the time code you'll see in the show notes. Uh, we, we gave a brief review and some general thoughts in the upfront and after the time code that you will uh, you will see in the show notes, after that we get deep into the show. Uh, we talk a lot about the story and the themes and the characters and the performances and what we liked and what we didn't like and all that stuff. So it is a eh, you know two ish hour conversation that we had uh, about uh, the Midnight Mass, and I adored it. I I thought it was a great conversation. I I thought. Uh, It did exactly what I hoped it would, which was to help me crystallize my thoughts and my feelings about the show and also see it through some different eyes and gain a little bit of perspective on the show as well. So uh, I think it's valuable. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, enough out of me. Let's uh, let's get to it. I'll talk to you on the other side. All right, well let's let's get into this. For uh, our, first of all, I'm Bo. Uh, with me is the the entire House of Salmons. <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I assume that the cats are around. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, there is a Pugsley in my lap right now. Yeah. See. Uh, but thanks for doing this. Um, thanks for watching uh, all of Midnight Mass. Not on my account, but. I, like I was telling you before I hit the record button, uh, I've been dying to have this conversation with uh, with someone or someones who have uh, seen Midnight Mass in its entirety. And uh, so I, I appreciate you guys being here, genuinely. Um, well, thank you for the invite to come on. So le- here's how I kind of want to try to go about this um, in in five stages. The first, uh, because there are going to be some people who start listening to this and perhaps I have not seen all of Midnight Mass, to which I would say, stop what stop all of this uh, and watch the end of Midnight Mass. But I, in a weird reverse order kind of situation, I would kind of like to hear a, a spoiler free mini review from you guys. And, and, and I'm going to give it a five star rating. I'm not going to oblige either of you or on a scale of five stars, uh, the old Netflix scale. So you do not have to, uh, rate it in such a way, but, but your spoiler free impressions as if you were talking to someone who had not seen it and, and in the nature, uh, of, of chivalry, Jamie, how about you go first? Uh, well, we are down with the old school Netflix ratings. That's the only way we do things in the House of Salmons. So that is not a problem. Excellent. Uh, for me, it's a five. Uh, I don't really think that would come as a surprise to anyone, considering uh, how I scream from the rooftops how much I love Flanagan. And uh, this time, I don't I don't feel like he failed me. Uh, he still has a perfect record with me. This is um, a spoiler-free it is, I think, wow, uh, an, uh, it's an excellent discussion about um, religion and fanaticism and other things with a very steep turn into Stephen King territory and uh, something that I appreciated. And we already know that he can adapt Stephen King directly. He's done it multiple times. And this, I, I feel like, has that flavor to it, but with the way that Flanagan can. All right. W- well done. Uh, Brian, uh, how, oh, did, how is Jamie wrong? 
No. Uh, <laughs> surprisingly, he knows this you. time he knows you. She's not. <laughs> Uh, I also give this a five. This was a movie or a series, I guess, that kind of crept up on me. I remember hearing something about it and then just forgot. And then we were watching something on YouTube and our YouTube reviewers started talking about it. And as soon as he said Mike Flanagan, I'm like, okay, well, I just turned off YouTube and turned on Netflix. So I might as well watch it. Because Flanagan is, he's got... The longest run of hits for me, second only to John Carpenter. And he, if he keeps on going the way he's going, he's going to probably surpass the master. Um, I liked everything he's done, and this was no exception. It is very solid. It has a lot of Stephen King flavor, but more than just like the, the setting and some of the tropes. He likes to have... It's got a big ensemble cast. It has quite a few different uh, stories going on all at once. And everything intersects. And everybody, you know, because it's a small town, everybody knows everybody. And everybody's in each other's business. So you get a lot of the mundane drama that comes with that. And then you just get this supernatural element. This horror that rests on top like a cherry. And just like Stephen King, it starts very small and goes and goes and goes, infecting everything in its path. And I love that. I love to see how these characters handle that, how they succumb to it, how some of them rise above and, you know, how others just go whole hog. Yeah, howdy, let's do it. So uh, it was really good. It's very much... Flanagan's take on a Stephen King story, but told in his own voice and through his own lens, and that's what I love. Excellent. I'm I, weirdly I am the lowest rating of everyone, but that's at a, uh, a a seller four and a half stars, and I'll get into some minor complaints. What? Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say on, for the spoiler-free side, I agree with with everything you guys said. I I do think that maybe it's almost unfair to say like, well, this is kind of Flanagan riffing on Stephen King. I think he's just so deeply influenced by Stephen King that that's just the kind of storyteller he is. Oh, absolutely. I don't I don't think that he set out to make a Stephen King story. I think that that's just Hey, I, well, what I said when we were watching this yesterday, we were like midway through, and I said he is he is clearly a student of Stephen King. I think that Stephen King resonates as much in his work as Lovecraft resonates in Stephen King's. Like it, it just it, that's who he wears his influences on his sleeve, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's what I was gonna say. Um, I write to the occasional thing now and then. And a big influence in me as Lovecraft, I don't necessarily consciously channel him or I definitely don't try to mimic his voice or anything like that. But a lot of stuff I do, he's going to have a big long shadow in it just because. And the same with Stephen King because he, you know, he was the first author I ever read or anything. So you're going to have your influences in your work. So, yeah, I don't think he was trying to, I want to do a Stephen King type story. I just think he told a story and his influences were out there in full display. Yeah. And uh, that said, it is also the Stephen King is Stephen King story that ever Stephen King. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But but, uh, and that's that's not a complaint by any stretch. But yeah, I I do think that it, it has that vibe. Um, and I also think it's one of, uh, like, I hate to throw around uh, adjectives like, well, this is a brave film or a brave series, but it is very ambitious in, in the kind of themes that it's tackling. And one of the concerns I had about halfway through was it's raising all these issues of uh, religion and faith and addiction are kind of the, the big ones. And I was worried that 
the stuff that I really like, these kind of conversations that characters would have about these things, that by the time you got to the end of it and the horror really became prominent, the, the, the actual horror story being told here, I was worried that that conversation between the show and the viewer would would fall by the wayside. And because I'm a stupid person, that was what I was afraid of. And then, of course, by the end of this series, like Flanagan is very clearly answering the questions that he's raised. Um, and, and maybe not decisively, but is cert- certainly presenting answers. So um, I, think, I, th- I think we're going to stop the non-spoiler stuff there. So, again, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Midnight Mass, all of us are saying you ought to watch this. It, it, it's really uh, a, a pretty impressive piece of work. Um, and now, uh, if you're listening past this, you've done it to yourself because we're about to launch into phase two of this discussion, which is let's talk about this story um, and, and, and jump in whenever. I, I will say that. I was a little bit fooled by the show because I really thought this was going to be Riley's story, who is sort of the prodigal son returning home uh, after being in prison, um, having been incarcerated for the negligent death of a passenger in his car when he uh, had an accident because he, he was drinking and passed out at the wheel. And, and so he comes home to the island, uh, Crockett Island, uh, the the crock pot as they call it, which I adored, um, and and it's he kind of finds this community in a little bit of a shambles. There was a, a an ecological disaster with an oil spill. Uh, a lot of people moved away as a result of some settlements that the oil company was handing out, and and it it's kind of there that we start the story with him bouncing off the residents of the island. Uh, kind of namely Aaron Green, as played by Kate Siegel, who is also relatively recently returned to the island and is now pregnant. And uh, so that's kind of the the beginning of the story. And I I was genuinely surprised that the show kind of did a a psycho. Yes. and, And had Riley so front and center for so long, and then all of a sudden he's gone. Yeah, I said... I, I love how late coming. it was. Usually when somebody does a psycho switch, it's right in the, you know, the first fourth of it. This, it, no, it keeps going and going and going. And then even past the halfway mark, it's still him. And then it does the switch. And I like that. I like being caught off guard. Well, what I thought was interesting was that you get the initial time when you think he's going to be out of the show or you know gone and i was like well shit i didn't see that coming at all and then because it seemed very there was a finality to it yes. it, it felt like it was very final but then you know there later on there's a knock at the door and i was like it's going to be him you know and so he's back and i'm like okay good they didn't do that you know well you know now we continue and then they took him again it was like they pulled a glenn from um from The Walking Dead, you know, where you have that one episode where Glenn was on top of the dumpster. Only not as stupid. And then- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Not as stupid. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean, though? Like, Glenn, that whole dumpster scene with Glenn, yes. when you thought he was going to be, he was a goner, and then, like, everyone shed their tears, and then they brought him back, and then only for Negan to bash his head in with a baseball bat. So it, um, it kind of puts me in mind of something like that. It's like he did a, he did a, switch on you and then he switched it back and then he switched it again and I'm like son of a bitch like <laughs> it was um uh, it was I, I love the way he did it though I love the way that he kept he kept just flipping my expectations and when the whole time yeah especially since we start the very first shot uh is like in that very first scene we have Riley and I and you know storytelling tells us that that's our main character and that's who we're going to be with the entire time. And then he was there for the majority of the run. And then all of a sudden he wasn't. And I, I, uh, I like it. I, I like it quite a bit. I think he did a really good job with that. And it kind of resolves like his story resolves itself in a satisfying way. 
But yeah, there's nothing left. I, I don't feel like it was shortchanged. I don't feel like he ended in, in things too quickly or without resolving everything. I think everything came to the end it was supposed to come to with him. And also there was some really clever foreshadowing throughout as far as his character, you know, with the dream sequences that he was having and the the fact that even when he went to see Aaron and he's like, hey, remember that time when, you know, we smoked a pack of cigarettes and waited for the sun to come up? Uh, will you do that with me now? And then right. I... I was taken off guard though. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about the fact that he was being literal and then, you know, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) and then Brian, like at the end, when you're seeing him like in the boat and then Brian's like, smoking, get it. (laughs) I really like the fact that social media kind of got a little teed off at Netflix for having the uh, autoplay between episodes five and six And, and five is, uh, you know, obviously that's the one where Riley uh, <laughs> smokes in the boat, and uh, and it kind of lands on um, Aaron screaming, and you hear that over the credits. Mm-hmm. And I saw a lot of people that were like, "Hey, Netflix, how about you fucking let this play out a little bit before you jump into the next episode?" Yeah, because I needed a minute to process what was happening. Yeah, um, I, I, and I. Um... I really loved that moment with her too. I I was thinking at the time when she's just screaming and screaming and screaming, I was just, I was thinking how impressive it was her. I've always liked, I've always liked Kate Siegel though. I, I've never had an issue with her being in Flanagan's work because she earns her spot. She is an excellent actress and I don't blame him for using her, her at all. I like it as a matter of fact, but and in that moment, I was just in awe of her ability. And I, it was kind of ripping my heart out. And then it just like went like, like straight into the neck. of I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm done with that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. That was a little frustrating, but all right. So we've got Riley who's returning home, also returning uh, or coming to the Island at the beginning um, is our father, Paul, who is taking the place of the Monsignor who went on a trip to the Holy Land and Father Paul is in theory stepping in and being the 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 priest for this island while the Monsignor is recovering who was clearly um, suffering the effects of dementia uh, before he ever left and so Father Paul is this kind of young charismatic priest who uh, starts you know, sort of uh, rejuvenating the church. And when I first watched this, I w- about episode three, I was like, huh, we're doing a needful things here. I got it. And then it's like, oh, no, it's a Salem slot. Yeah, oh, you fooled me, Mike Flanagan. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a needful things and, and you, you, you got me with a Salem slot. And which I loved. I love the fact that at, at a certain point you realize like, oh, this this father father paul is actually just the monsignor only now he is young and healthy and vibrant uh but also uh has an unhealthy lust for blood uh as you do and you know i i could see a world in which that shift might turn you off but i really love the the framing method of father paul essentially giving confession to no one to tell the story of what happened. Oh, I really like that too. And I like how he would be doing that. Like it would, the the scene would shift into him doing his confessionals. And then, you know, for instance, one time was right after he passed out. And then he is like, like, quickly brought out of that by a, a, a light shining in his eyes. And that's when he's in the doctor's office and she's like shining a light. So, and, and then you get out, oh, like these are, these are things that are going on internally. And I thought that was very clever. I also really enjoyed the performance of Hamish Linklater, who, um, who played the father. I, I could not stop just watching him whenever he was on screen. He had he had such charisma in his delivery that he could just have these long soliloquies. And 
I was just wrapped. I was in it. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if I'm familiar with that actor from anything else. If I am, I can't put my finger on it, but holy shit. I think he was perfect in that role. He was so good. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can find a filmography from this guy. He was, uh, boy, he was in a lot of crap battleship and that, uh, fantastic four movie. That wasn't very good. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Right. Um, so he has a career. I just am not, not a aware good of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, he was in the Big Short. Um, yeah, the, I mean, hasn't really been a featured player in anything that uh, I'm seeing here. Kind of started his career around 2000. I mean, he's been around for about 20 years, working huh. fairly steadily, but just kind of bit bit parts and that kind of thing. But yeah, he really does seem to be the revelation in this show of. Uh, I got a message from uh, one Kate Pollock uh, that was just her saying that in, in some of the sermons that he's delivering that like, she's like, I'm not religious, but I was like totally into, like I was ready to march in God's army myself, you know? Well, uh, I, uh, I, I gotta say there were several scenes throughout this thing had tears. There were tears in my eyes, like just pouring down my face from stuff he was saying. And I'm not religious, you know, that, I mean, I was raised that way, but you know, I, I turned away from it at a, at a fairly early age and uh, it just, it, I was kind of amazed at, at, at what this show was, was capable of as far as my, what was going on within myself. It, I don't know. It, it kind of blew me away and I had to stop and remind myself <laughs> <laughs> that like this is not what you think you know <laughs> this is not this is not what you believe because he was so convincing well and i think that's one of the things that the the story does really well is that every every great villain believes their own bullshit and this is a character in you know father paul or the returning monsignor however you want to look at it he honestly believes he is doing the right thing and, oh, yeah. you know, that that despite all of the horrors that visit upon him throughout the course of, of the story, um, that he continues to believe that he is going to help people. And I think oh, that's yeah. yeah, that's what makes an effective villain. You know, it was best of intentions that he damned everyone. You know, it's the yeah. whole road to hell. It's, you know, everybody's the hero in their own story. And there's also, it's got to be said that in this world, this isn't our world. Because I got the pretty clear impression that nobody here has ever heard the word vampire. Nobody says it right. It's taken that Salem's Lot thing where like nobody says vampire for... 150 pages or whatever to yeah. the illogical extreme where no one ever says it ever. And it never comes. I mean, some people come into a house, there's a dead body lying on the floor, covered in blood. There's another guy in the corner of the room. He's covered in blood. His mouth's covered in blood. And everybody's like, huh, I wonder what happened here. And it's like, you don't have to name the name, but you know what's going on, right? You're aware of this thing. And so I can only assume, once again, uh, in The Walking Dead, that's in a world where zombies, zombie mil films, zombie movies, zombie books, whatever, they don't exist. Because whenever they're, you know, when the zombies first came up, people are like, what is that? I don't know. They're walkers. They're, you know, rotters. They're stinky or whatever the hell you want to call them. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't, in fairness, have not kept up with Walking Dead. If, oh, there, if there is a faction that re refers to them as the Stinkies, I'm <laughs> back on board. Awesome. Yeah. Where does but it happen? I'll jump back in. But that was very much like here because I, as soon as stuff starts happening, somebody should be go vampires. I did. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I mean, it, it's like when they found all the cats on the beach, the guy was like, you know, it could be, it could be a disease. It could be like a, a virus. It could be. And I was like, a vampire. Well, even, <laughs> even before that, when uh, 
the mysterious man as he was when he first came to town. He's dragging that trunk, yeah. and then he hears somebody knocking on the inside. I'm like, oh, okay, he's got a vampire in there. That's the first thing I thought of when he started. And we didn't know who he was no. at that point. We had no idea who was dragging that 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 chest in. And uh, the first thing I thought of was, and I was being flippant with myself, like in my head. And I was just like, oh, what's he got, a vampire? You know, but it, because uh, part of me was like, it's not going to be that. Like, it's not going to, it's not going to be a vampire. That's just silly. And, and, and it's not silly. I think he did an excellent job with it. But I was, I was expecting that he would subvert that expectation, you know, that it would be something totally different. Um, but then um, it was, and I, and I honestly, I'm, I'm loving what he did with it. I love the fact that it was a holy land. That, well, you know, of that course. I love the fact I mean, that, that the priest sees it as an angel, you know, yeah. that, uh, but that's my point. I mean, if you saw that guy, you would not just go angel. I know angels. I mean, hell, if you ever read the Bible, angels look nothing like the guys with the white wings and the little halos and all that. They are some scary. I mean, they're straight out of Lovecraft. I mean, they are. Whoa. I mean, this thing here is nothing compared to the actual angels out of the Bible. But still, if I saw this guy with the huge bat wings and the fangs and the claws, I'm not going to go, oh, it's an angel. So, I mean, that again leads me to believe this is a world where for whatever reason vampires don't exist or but they do have a one throwaway line where like that's what all the myths must have been about when they're talking about the blood disease and the iron deficiency yeah right the, and I'm like, the paleness yeah, the sense and i'm like myths light. of what what are the myths say it and nobody does yeah, I, so. I do, I do like. I hadn't thought about it before, but yeah, him tapping, uh, the the, you know, the big trunk with the vampire in it is very let the right one in. Yes, exactly. Um, I I hadn't put that together, but yeah, that that's totally what that is. But yeah, so right, so he brings this vampire to the village, uh, to this island that's kind of cut off geographically anyway. And the people who live on the island are all, you know, to one degree or another, either broken or uh, looking for some kind of salvation. Um, and then uh, one plot thread that I, I, I do want to explore a little is the story of the, the girl Lisa, who has been Joe Colley, uh, as they call it, Joe Colley uh, shot... Uh, drunkenly shot uh, this poor girl, not intentionally, you know, it wasn't the, the fact that it happened has totally devastated this guy. Um, much like Riley was devastated by his accident. But um, yeah, so this girl Lisa is in a wheelchair ever since and the first sign that something uh, unusual is afoot other than all the dead cats and whatnot. Um, which is unusual in fairness, but uh, it, it's that she gets out of her chair and walks. You know, she, uh, she, she. As it happens, the entire town that are not the entire town, but everybody taking communion in this church also is ingesting vampire blood, which is restoring their health to to the point that this girl can get out of her wheelchair and walk around like a person. Uh, not that people who are in wheelchair aren't people. You understand what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. No, I didn't even catch that. Like a real person, <laughs> like you know, like right. Like, well, just that it erases the 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 fact of her accident. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and and I'll say the the moment where I I was like, damn it, Flanagan, you did it to me again. Is the scene where she goes to confront Joe Colley in his trailer after she has been restored the ability to walk and that conversation and particularly uh the performance from uh let me get his name i think it's robert longstreet is his name uh who plays J joe collie um i mean it 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 fucking broke me that uh, was oh my god i his character on the whole that <sighs> when pike died I was beside myself because of Joe Colley's reaction to that. 
it broke my heart. It, I was just sobbing. And then uh, when he had that confrontation with Lisa, his, his, I mean, I just wanted to hug that man. I felt so horrible for him because he has been punishing himself just daily uh, since this happened. And it, and, and it just, it, it tears you up to think, you know, should I feel sorry for someone who has, even though it was an accident for someone who put someone else's life in danger that way, just because of their negligence. And then, I mean, it's a, it's a tough thing. Guilt is a tough thing. It's, it's a very tough thing. And then you're, you, you have to start, you start thinking about things like at what point, what should, you know, should he be able to forgive himself, you know, or should he, should he have to live with this his entire life or should someone be sentenced to something like that for an accident? I mean, it's just all of these thoughts that just come pouring out of my own head and then watching his reaction to her, it, um, I mean, her, her performance was really powerful in that scene as well. And that, I, I just was, and I wasn't ever sure which way she was going to go with it, you know, because she was really angry and I, I was just like, what's going to happen here? Like, where, where are we going to leave this? And it, that was a, just a really good scene. I like that it ran the gambit. It went back and forth because at least for me, initially when she showed up, I figured it'd be the sappy sentimental, I forgive you. And there was some of that there, but there was also a whole lot of rage and a whole lot of, I hate you. Mm -hmm. You did this to me. You did this to my family. You stole from me yeah. all that time. And not just that, but I mean, look at the, look at what happened to her family as a result. You know, they're now paying rent on a house they used to own. Yeah. You know, because of all the, the doctor bills, I, it, it just, it, the repercussions of, of his actions have just run so deep that yeah, all of her anger is completely justified. No, it seemed you know? very, very real. Not just a, you know, a, a beneficial, you know, I forgive you, go in peace. And no, I, I'm glad she still has some of that rage and she still has a lot of that frustration, but she can get beyond it. And she's like, look, I forgive you. Yeah, that when the scene starts with her asking, he's got a gun mounted, <laughs> you know, Chekhov's uh, rifle is yeah. on the uh, uh, mounted on his wall. When she asks him, "Is that the gun?" and he he says, "No, I could I threw it in the bay, uh, uh, you know, the day after. Like I can't, I couldn't own that." And and her saying, uh this your home looks like i i thought it would and that that made me happy because it looks like shit and it looks like yeah. your life is shit yeah well then she even went on to say when i say it looks like i thought it would what i mean to say is it looks like i hoped it would yeah yeah you know a, 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 what a terrific a terrifically written scene that is so many of those in this show uh, it, it's t the dialogue here, the conversations that are had between these characters with between the moments of horror, because what you have really here is a drama with a lot of depth. And these characters are all fleshed out so well. Well, that's the advantage of doing uh, an episodic uh, limited series. I, I heard some people go, well, you know, in typical Netflix fashion, I watched the first show and not much happened. Of course, they were drawing it out, but I don't agree with that. I can kind of see their point because, you know, people are used to a 90 minute movie in out done. But the good thing about this, and it can be a bad thing. I mean, God knows there has been series, once again, <laughs> The Walking Dead. <laughs> where they just drag things out and just pad every episode because they're more interested in hitting a certain number of episodes and then telling a good goddamn story. But when done right, you can use this extended time to really flesh out the characters, really flesh out the dialogue. I mean, it's like a novel. There's so many times... Even the best of films, if they're based off a novel, a lot of good stuff has to get cut, you know, cut off and put to the side just because you don't have the time. 
here you have the time. So you can indulge. And as long as it's good, as long as, you know, it's well done, I'm all for it. Yeah, I did actually see a comment where some today where someone said that they had watched the first episode and nothing happened, yeah. so they gave up. And I'm like, what the fuck? What? First Sucks of all, to be you. <laughs> first right. of all, I don't agree with any of no. that. Like, I don't think I don't think even in the first episode that nothing happened. I feel like there was a lot going on there. And if you are that level of of <laughs> if you have that level of or lack of concentration <laughs> that you can't, you know, even get past the first episode where we're just introducing things, then clearly it, you probably did the right thing by, by, by not continuing because I don't think they would in the end get anything out of it. No. Yeah. And I, I wonder if there isn't a little bit of maturity required to watch something like this. And, and I don't mean, I, I think it's an intention span thing almost where like it, you have to yes. kind of accept that, I, you know, like, like you guys were saying, this is a more of a novel than it is a short story. Like a, a, a movie is like a short story. Yes. This is the novel, you know, um, immediately after watching this, uh, I went and watched the director's cut of Dr. Sleep because I couldn't get enough Flanagan. And I needed more of it <laughs> injected into my veins. And the director's cut strikes me like that, too. Even though it's abbreviated, it's still three hours long. And it's a little, there's a little bit more room for that story to breathe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was actually, uh, coincidentally, on the way home today, finishing up the 2019 episode of, of the Summer Series, where Duncan blames you for uh, ruining the theatrical cut of Dr. Sleep for him by making him watch the director's cut. <laughs> So now yeah. you can't go back to the theatrical cut because it's disappointing in comparison. Yeah. And that to me just goes, yeah, sometimes you do need that extra time to flesh that stuff out. But it could also just be maybe they went into this person who watched it one time, one episode and said, nah, uh, maybe they went into it thinking it was something else. Because this the first episode isn't really a horror show. It is far more a drama than anything else. Yeah, there's an occasional spooky thing that happens, but if you're looking for a horror show, that first episode isn't it. But just give it time. Let it build its world, its character. Let it flesh out the story. And yeah, you will get to the horror stuff, and you'll get to a lot of it, and it'll be good. Yeah, and just to put a button on, on my Joe Colley scene... Uh, thing because uh, as I, I said in the upfront, all of this uh, recording is just about me finally getting all of these emotions and thoughts out of my body. Um, the the fact that his performance is just I am trying unsuccessfully not to sob. Yeah. Oh man, it just breaks my Robert Longstreet is uh is, is another one of those guys that's been around for a while, but it, now that he's found his way into the Mike Flanagan stable of actors, like he had that great turn in Haunting of Hill House, mm -hmm. uh which I thought was great. And I think he's just a show stealer in the scenes he's in in this. Like there's that conversation. One one of the things uh in the story of course is that Riley is going to these AA meetings on the island with Father Paul where they have these uh very poignant discussions about addiction and faith and that kind of thing and Joe Colley joins them. And there's a great scene between Riley and Joe Colley uh which you know for plot purposes serves the purpose of having Joe Colley tell Riley, hey, I've got a sister that passed away, and I wish that I had been sober enough to go see her before she died. Um, but there's a great moment where he says, does it, does, it get, does it get any better, or is it always like this? And Riley tells him, I don't know that it gets better, but it gets different. And it was such a like an interesting way to approach the idea of uh addiction which is a you know a theme that flows through this and we'll we'll probably talk about that in a little more detail but uh i just think that that the joe collie character is you know he's my wolf from the talisman or whatever like that's the character that i just fell in love with and and 
no, it, you know, I know I'm going to watch this again. And when I do, I'm already going to be just crying when he comes on screen. Cause I'm like, Oh, he's gonna, he's gonna die. So heinously <laughs> where, you know, this priest ends up sucking on his head. Like it's a, <laughs> a Capri sun. <laughs> and honestly, that broke my heart as well, because he was so proud of himself and he'd been, He'd, he'd had such a difficult day because we had just seen him standing in front of the cooler, staring at the beer, trying to talk himself out of the beer. And honestly, I think he may have, we don't know, well, but I think he may have ended up going for it if the sheriff hadn't shown up. Let's be honest. It was old Milwaukee, so it wasn't that hard to pass up. Yeah. <laughs> there, there were some cores on the top show. I was just about to say the same thing. But he had that really hard moment. He was having a hard day, and he made it through that. And he he went there to share that with the priest. He was, he just, that to me just made that scene that much more heartbreaking because he was finally at a place where, you know, he'd had this confrontation with Lisa. He had, he was, I think, finally getting to a place where he might be able to forgive himself. And he was also thinking of himself as more worthy you know, because the Joe Collie we saw in the earlier portion of the series, he he would have been just fine if he had dropped dead at any moment because his life had zero meaning at that point. And it was nothing but just daily guilt and beating himself up and hating life. And his drinking was was a result of that, of all of that. Well, I, he was drinking before that. That's kind of what caused it. But I mean, it, it didn't help. And so we're getting to a point in his life where he is seeing himself as being worthy of something and <laughs> seeing that there can be good things ahead. And then it fucking comes to an end. And that was that's horrible. That's the point though. That's where horror hits home. I mean, as much as I like the tales from the crypt and all the EC comic stuff, I mean, for their bad stuff always happens to bad people. Here, I like the fact that bad stuff can happen to good people. Now, I don't want a whole movie of that. I don't want a whole story of good people just getting their face, you know, pushed into a cheese grater over and over and over again. But that makes it real, and that makes the emotion resonate. Well, I think um, there was a mention of Psycho earlier, and if, you know, if you'll re recall in Psycho, the Janet Lee. Yeah. It was the moment of her redemption that when yeah. she was murdered, you know, it, it was the moment that, that she had turned the corner and decided to go back and make things right. And she never and got the chance. I that's what that, that was important for that character. That's you know? what adds the sadness. To yeah. It. That was important for the impact of her death. You needed to be able to feel for her because up to that point she was a thief. And, and you're just like, uh, now, even though she had her own reasons, it, she wasn't exactly a bad person, but she had done bad things. Yeah. But it was it was important to the impact of her death that it she found her redemption right before that. That just made it hit that much harder. And I think that that same thing is true of Joe as well as Riley. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. that is obviously something that writers have been doing for a while and they know it's because it works. And I think that Flanagan just fucking nailed it, man. He makes you give a shit about these characters. He makes you care. And then it just snatches it out from under you. And again, with this many characters in the story at the same time, you need that extra length to do that. Otherwise, if he had tried to do, do this in like a movie, it, I don't think it would have worked. You couldn't have, have had this, this secondary many, character. You couldn't have had this many characters no. and actually have it be as impactful if, as it was with a shorter runtime, it just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked. All right. So let's, now that we've established some of our characters here and, and really the, the Joe Colley murder is at first is unintentional, but that's when the bloodlust overcomes father Paul and he ends up, you know, sucking on his head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which actually, yeah, that, I was thinking the same thing when he was, I was like, oh, he's not even going for the throat. Now, the head is where the wound is, so it only makes sense. But it was, it was kind of interesting that he just was sucking on his head. Yeah, 
And and that's where uh, Bev Keen, the Mother Carmody uh, of, I, of our story. I called her that. Well, the whole time I was like, oh, oh really, Mrs. Carmody? That's what... <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, who I think, by the way, she's terrific in this in, in this role. I think she gets that kind of town busybody, holier than thou kind of character really right. Uh, that conversation she has with the sheriff about locking up the poison, you know, when he's asking her about like, well, Pike got poisoned and you're the one who's always in this closet. And when she kind of turns it on him and says, you know what? You don't even have to say it. You're right. I know you're right. And from now on, I'm going to keep all this locked up. And you can see uh, on sh- the sheriff's face, who, by the way, is the, you know, the, the Muslim character who is trying to raise a son and trying to raise a son in a community that where maybe they're not seen as total outsiders, even though it's very clear <laughs> from Bev Keen's character that he is still very much the outsider. Uh, but I like the fact that Bev Keen like at the very least thinks she's always one step ahead even if she's not you know she's a little a little too clever by half uh as it happens well and that's what comes back to bite her in the ass at the very end when she has her great cleansing her flood of fire and then it's like oops (laughs) yeah oh you fucked up bev you got a little too and and you know we'll get to sort of the the themes that play there but yeah so you know, as as the town starts to heal itself, or their bodies are being healed, um, there is this larger rot underneath it all, where uh, we understand that now that Father Paul uh, has this blood r- hunger, as does uh, Riley before he confesses what's going on to Aaron. You know, we have that that moment where he basically tells her, "Here's what's going on in this town." Um, and then she goes to uh, Annabeth Gish's character, who is taking care of her mother, who it turns out was a surprise Alex Esso. Uh, right. Which I didn't I didn't get I didn't for a couple of episodes. Her. And then I was like, yeah. oh, shit, that's Alex Esso. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, and, and so we start to convene Salem's Lot style, our team of vampire hunters, who are which coincidentally include a school teacher and a doctor or maybe not so coincidentally but yeah i'm all for it all they were missing was a writer in the mix and you'd be all set yeah well for sure and but you know I, again i think it's just because we're all of that age where we we have the same kind of influences that mike flanagan does in terms of you know writing and movies and that kind of thing and if you're gonna rip off and I, I'm saying rip off in a very loving way, like you know the the old adage about good artists borrow and great artists steal. Yeah. Um, I, I think that if you're going to rip off a vampire story, you can do a lot worse than Salem's Lot. And and this has a lot of those elements of the small town and all these characters. And as things get horrific, we sort of see how all these relationships between these characters kind of play out. Um, and particularly, and it all kind of leads up to this one night when the entire town, uh, who have been sort of energized by the miracles that Father Paul is, uh, performing, uh, they're all going to this midnight Easter mass because at this point, Father Paul can't go out in the sunlight so much. Yeah. Uh, But, uh, they have this big Easter mass where he is going to introduce them to this angel. And Special guest speaker Jim Jones. Yeah, yeah right. Um, yeah, and it's it, hey, we're gonna we're gonna have all these people drink some some of this rat poison, and they are going to be reborn as these perfected immortal creatures, and and that's what at a, at his best, Father Paul, who has been you know ultimately seduced by you know his own youth and the idea that he can have this second chance at life and and all that kind of thing uh and wants to give it to other people and thinks that it's a positive whereas bev keen is more like oh no 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 this is 
this is revelations and I'm here at ground zero for it and am helping it on its way. Um, and yeah. And so everybody, like I would say what 30, 40% of the congregation takes the poison. The other half become food pretty quickly. And, and that all leads up to the final episode, which is sort of the, you know, the, like the destruction of Crockett Island as a whole. Yeah, the, I, I love the fact that he, that the father had a very specific plan in place to keep everyone inside so that they could, you know, walk them through what was happening, sort of orientate them to what was going on. And he, cause he had this in mind, like he knew what was going to happen. He knew that they would awaken with this bloodlust. And so he wanted to keep everything contained until they could get a handle on it. And she just is like, open the doors. And he knew what would happen if she let them out because everyone in town, even though there is, there's only a population of, of 127 people in this town, uh, maybe up to 129 because Riley came back and so did Aaron. So I don't know, somewhere under 130 people in this town, all of them are not in the congregation, even though the majority of them seem to be. I mean, you know, it, it started out a very small congregation in the beginning, but once the miracles started happening, then more and more people started flooding into the church, which is exactly what he wanted. And you still had those outliers, though. You still had those people, like the one Howie, Howie Hobbs at the end, mm-hmm. who uh, who Bev is like, you know, I've never, I've never seen you in mass one day in your life, you know. And he's just like, what's going on? And I love, I love that scene because he's like, oh, what is happening? And she's like, see, uh, to paraphrase, you'd know what was happening if you came to church. But since you didn't come to church, you don't have an idea what's going on. But I just, I, I love that moment. But anyway, she no, lets, it, she it, lets let me, them out. Let me stop you right there. Cause the other part of that moment is him saying, I think I killed my wife and child. I don't understand what's happening to me. And that, I mean, like Brian was saying earlier of just this random, probably decent guy. Yeah. Being forced into a position where he, not only has he been killed, he is now murdered his family and doesn't understand for a second any of it. And and that to me is one of the most horrifying moments in the whole show. Oh yeah. Well and character. then she just she digs it in deeper when she's like, Well, I, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but you could have saved him. Yeah. 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 The power to but that right there, again, she ties it in to she ties it into religion, which she's like, you know, the power to save them was with you the entire time. Uh, which everything she says, it, it's like it. She's speaking directly out of the Bible, um, and, and a lot of it is her own interpretation of things, which happens, uh, you know, just in real life. But it's, I, I love the fact that her character is able to take every single thing and flip it back uh, toward religion, and she basically tells him, "You had the power to save them." as you were saved but you didn't know what was going on she so revels in the exclusive ex- <laughs> exclusivity of it oh, instead yeah. of being yeah. inclusive she likes the us versus them my team your team and i was right look at me i chose the right team and you know she she wants that and i love the when uh, riley's mom and the character's name escapes me but when she has her moment at the end where she goes out to confront her and you know nobody ever told you this but somebody probably should have you're not a good person (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's a it's such a almost midwestern insult yeah well yeah it's straight out of wizard of oz you know when auntie m says to uh what's her face the witch on the bike uh when she says to her she's like i have wanted to say to you you know, there are so many things I've wanted to say to you as long as I've known you, but now being a Christian woman, I can't, uh, you know, so she can't say it, but she, it's, it's just that moment that, that, you know, and this woman is not holding back though. She's just like, somebody should have told you a long time ago, you're not a good person. And, and she's not, and you're right, Brian, about the exclusivity of it. She it doesn't want people to be well, they, saved and she wants people to do what she wants them to do. Yeah. 
she wants to lord it <laughs> over them. <laughs> she wants, you know, you all thought I was crazy. You thought I was silly, but I was right. That's the most important thing to her. To be proven right. Oh, and her jealousy when Riley gets turned. Oh, and yeah. She, you, it just, she's spitting just green venom. But even in yeah. that scene where the mother confronts her, she even, uh, she's like, and then Riley, nya, 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 nya. And mom is like, no, God loves Riley just as much as he loves you. Yeah. And that's what gets you mad, isn't it? And right. that's exactly it. I'm not God's, you know, perfect little snowflake. I'm not his most favorite. He could actually love somebody as much as me. Wham. When I'm the pious one. Yeah. I'm the one who's lived my life the way he's supposed to. But have you really? Well, no, that's... Have you really? That's you know, like, the worst kind of, you know, not necessarily Christian, but any religion. Any, you know, that us versus them mentality. That we have it right. We know what's going on, and everybody else is just infidels and stupid, and they're all going to burn in lake and fire. And I can't wait to see it. I'm going to be laughing at the gates of you know heaven as they're all screaming, and it's just like, really? That's what your religion teaches you? Right. Okay. Good on you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that great moment uh, during the kind of school board meeting about Bev Keen handing out the Bibles. Where uh, the sheriff is like, you know, what would you think if I went around town handing out copies of the Koran? And because that's that's what we're talking about here. It's not I don't mind you. I don't mind you encouraging the kids to explore religion. It's the idea of saying this is the religion you have to study. Yeah, this is the correct one. All right. the other ones are nice, but let's face it, they're not right. Well, this is the right one. <laughs> and I, I love the fact that they brought to light the, all of the misconceptions that she had about Islam. And, oh, yeah. And she was just like, oh, well, you hate Jesus. And, you you know, and he's like, no, he's like, you don't understand at all. And he's like, that's, that's no. <laughs> like, you clearly don't know what you're talking about. And that is... I was just over here watching that whole scene uh, with the meeting. Just, just, ooh, I was on one hand, whenever she was speaking, I was gnashing my teeth. I was angry. But whenever he was, he was speaking, I'm like, yes. Yeah. And I love the fact that Aaron was like, eh, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like, this is, this is your, oh, oh no. When somebody said, uh, you know, when they brought up, you know, science and math. And she's like, oh, it's like if they had a science book or a history book. And Aaron's like, you know, eh. yeah, <laughs> they're, right. they're really not the same. <laughs> you can tell that she's trying to moderate this, but also understands that she is far outnumbered in the room. And the 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 looks that she exchanges with Hassan uh, in that moment where she's like, I don't know what you want me to do. Like, I'm on your side and you're right. But I don't think either of us are going to be well served by making a scene, and and but ultimately he's right, you know that because what he says about the Quran is, you know what we believe is that the Prophet Muhammad uh, taught us that it's the priests and the organization that get in the way of our relationship to God, and you know one of the great points of this show is that's absolutely true it no matter how good your intentions are the larger an organization becomes the the more easy it is for that intention to be perverted into something dark and malevolent and and not that father paul was right in bringing vampirism to crockett island but he at least was more right than Bev Keen, who was just using the church and religion as a weapon against against her neighbors, against anybody in the town that she felt superior to, which was pretty much everyone, and and giving her the ability to choose who lives and who dies and all that stuff. You know, like to the to the point where we were talking about the uh, the poor guy who got turned into a yeah. vampire you know she basically excommunicates him to die at first light and then father paul 
tells him, no, everyone is welcome in St. Patrick's. Right. You come in here, son. You are welcome in here. And I love that moment, too, because she has basically, in all of her wisdom, has basically missed the entire point of Christianity. Yeah. And and she for all the for all the times that she wants to bring up the teachings of Jesus, she clearly didn't understand them. And I just, I I love that moment because she's out there, you know, kicking him out because he didn't come to God sooner when that is never something that if you follow the teachings of Jesus, that's never something he would have done. And it, it, uh, (laughs) that's another moment. These are, it's moments like that when even though I'm, I'm not religious, it, it, it was, it touched me. You know, when when Father Paul said that to him and he's just like, no, you come in here. This is and I'm just like, yes, that's the way it's supposed to be yeah, there. Yeah, there uh, we'll get into the, all of this here in a second. But uh, just to kind of finish up the uh, the events of the story and obviously we're leaving out a ton of stuff. But um, when all hell breaks loose on the island and these newly forged vampires are just running amok in town, killing everyone that they can get their, you know, mouths on to, to suck their blood. Uh, and one thing I do really like about these vampires or the, this spin on it is that as soon as blood enters the picture, the, like all conscious thought stops, you know, and, and, uh, father Paul talks to Riley about that, about like, yeah, there's a point where, you like you can't decide for yourself anymore it's just this impulse takes over and that extends to the main vampire the the angel uh in question and some of my favorite stuff is in that last episode uh like when the kids when lisa and uh riley's brother are running around town trying to trying to get away or try to get to a boat and they they go into the (laughs) <laughs> the house that is the lair of this thing. And it doesn't really pay any attention to him because it's already feeding. Yeah. It even I, waves them. Yeah, away. I love yeah. it. It's like, go away. <laughs> yeah. And like they're pouring Swats gas on them. it and shit. And, and he's just like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. get out of here, kid. You bother me. Um, I, Again, when Aaron is slicing up his wings at the end, he is so deep into uh-huh. the feeding that he doesn't even pay attention to what she's doing to him. Yeah, he has that one moment of clarity, but then she like takes his head and pushes it back to her neck. Yeah, and he's like, "Oh yeah, this is what I was doing." Right? Yeah, right. Oh, wait. oh, right. Blood. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a great martyr moment for her as she's trying to seal this thing's fate, even as she uh, sacrifices herself. Um, yeah, and and leave it to Mike Flanagan where the happy ending of this story is that Hassan and his now vampire kid died together in prayer, which is sort of a happy resolution to their relationship in as much as anything is happy in this movie. Um, Father Paul and um, Alex Esso's character are finally confessing that they're the parents of... uh, uh, what's her name? Annabeth Gish. And they all kind of die together. And Henry Thomas and his wife, the Riley's parents, die uh, singing a hymn without having killed anyone because they were able to resist that urge. Oh, that was when you were talking about the urge that it made me think of them when they came together. They found each other. And he's like, I didn't. And she's like, I didn't either. And he's like, you know, what I found, he's like, yes, I'm hungry. I feel it. It hurts. But I choose not to. Yeah. uh, And that right there, the two of them together, that was a heartbreaking thing for me, too. Because earlier in the series, we had that moment that one of my favorite uh, bits in the entire series was the montage that we got of when people were starting to feel younger and people were starting to regain their vigor. And it started out with the two of them dancing, you know, and then it ended with her kind of taking him off to the bedroom, which I thought was great. It was very cocoon. 
It, well, you know, it <laughs> yeah. was. It was. It was. It was kind of wonderful. I just, I love that whole montage. I think it was perfect. That's a great and, thing about being a vampire. Never grow old. And they never had. Die. <laughs> they had such, and they don't get diabetes. They had <laughs> such an amazing relationship that in the beginning, when we first meet them, he just seems so gruff and distant, and. It's just, you know, it's like, eh, it's just one of those. They've been married for a long time. And to the, it's almost to the point where they kind of don't even realize the other person is around. Uh, and then when it starts to, you know, reawaken them, then, you know, they find that we actually watch their relationship come back to life. And then, you know, in the end, it ends the way that probably the best way that something like this could end. I mean, I, I do think that this does have a happy ending considering everything that's happening. I don't really know what else you could do with it. And uh, there, I mean, there is no better resolution for these people because they don't want to live this way. That would be no way to live. And I think going out the way that each of them did, each of them basically chose how they were going to go. Some of them for the betterment of others, like Aaron and then Riley's parents, you know, together. I, I thought it was a very beautiful moment. Their whole story was beautiful to me as a, you know, them as a couple. And it, I, I found a big smile on my face at the end and uh, along with the tears. Cause I was crying a lot too, but it, but it was, I, they had come to the end that they they had both accepted it and they were together and I think that that was that was because what really hurt me was when they were separated and I was just like oh my god you know when they're pulling her away in the church and he's staying behind and he's getting attacked and then you get the guy you know just like are they ever going to see each other again you know but then they do find each other like oh my god oh my god and and the final moments of the show. In, in its entirety uh, again th uh, this is what I was pointing to of like this is a Mike Flanagan happy ending is Lisa in the boat saying I can't oh. feel my legs and yeah. that's a good thing yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's worn off yeah and, and like you know that she's gonna go on and be able to live you know a normal life or you know non vampiric life and so is this kid and probably the the angel is dead i mean we don't know that for sure but certainly that is that's the suggestion and and the riley's brother says you know it's 30 miles to the mainland and that thing's not they, flying so good i think they really should have showed him going down i i felt like you needed to see that yeah but, but you know that that's one of my minor quibbles with it uh Mine too. yeah but um, well, my, I, I said last night, cause Brian said that last night, you know, he was like, you know, we need to, you need to see that happening. You know, that's, that is the most satisfying conclusion. You need to see it in. And I said, I choose to believe that he didn't make it. I think that, I think that Riley's brother made it pretty clear that, I mean, 30 miles is a long way to fly when you can barely fly. You also choose to believe that Gordon jumped out a window in Friday 13th Part 4. He did. Doesn't make it true. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He jumped out that window and he got away. Shut up. So the, <laughs> I choose to believe that that thing didn't make it. And that's where I'm, that's, I'm, that's, I'm going to my grave with that. Um. Anything else we want to say about just kind of plot and story here? I mean, that's that's sort of the broad strokes of what happens, as well as uh, a few key scenes that we love. But I don't, I don't want to sell either of you short. If there's a moment in the story that you want to highlight, because there there are a number of them. One of my favorite parts was when Bull was walking down the street and he passes the abandoned house, and the door just creaks open. Yeah. Me personally, I would have went nope and just <laughs> kept on going. But then he starts going toward the house, and he's like, "Hey, who's there?" And you hear the "Hey, who's there?" And you can tell it's a it's mimicry. It's it's a close approximation, but he can't do it perfectly. And I like that. I like what they did with the angel, with the vampire master or lord or whatever. He was all bestial and very feral and I thought he was just going to be more animalistic than anything but then right before he you know takes care of Riley 
he's walking around in a hat and coat and doing his thing. And so there's... He's obviously very sentient. Like yeah, he, there's an intelligence there. There's something there, but there's not a whole lot of it. Or he just has it. I don't know. It's like, is he... Is that who he was? Is that part of what he was? Or is he impersonating this? It's almost, he, yeah, like a weird defense mechanism almost of, like, I can imitate people. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, he was just chilling in the temple or whatever in the middle of desert for God knows how long. He wasn't wearing clothes. Granted, could have been there so long they rotted away or something. But I always got the impression, and he was just, you know, Hey, this is me. What are you going to do? And then now he's taking on all these trappings, especially at the end when he comes out with the priest garb on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt I expected him to be, which I find interesting because once we, when we first meet him in the cave, um, uh, by the way, real quick shout out to Flanagan here. When in, in that moment, when we're getting the, the, the flashback from father Paul and he talks about it and he says, you know, the words, it was an angel if you look behind the angel's head, oh, you can halo? very yeah. faintly see a <laughs> halo. And it's not it, its not in your face. It's very, very subtle. And those are the kind of things that I love Flanagan for. Because if you pay attention, you will see so many amazing things in what he does. But that I expected him to be more Barlow from the film. And it turns out he's actually more Barlow from the novel. Well, I think he was a good, because I think he's very, very much Barlow from Salem's Lot. I mean, he has that, not exactly Nosferatu look, but it's akin to it. He could be a kissing cousin. Um, he's very animalistic and very snarly and hissing and all that stuff. But even in Salem's Lot, Barlow, he, well, he wore clothes. He, you know, he he did humanistic things, even if he looked totally non-human. And I think that was, whether a conscious decision or a subconscious one or a nod, I think some of that was here. Oh, yeah. I, there was a lot of that here. Uh, just in various, various things. Uh, also, very cool eye effects. I really like the vampire oh, yeah. eye he, You know what? I was thinking about it because he did similar things in Oculus, oh, in, yeah. in Hill House. Um, he just, he, that seems to be something that he really enjoys. And I've actually heard someone complain about that before that he, Why? that he does that. I love it. I don't I like cool was, shit. Yeah. yeah. I love that when you, I've never heard that eyes are the windows to the soul. Boo hoo hoo hoo. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, he knows what he's doing and he's doing everything he does on purpose. And I, and it's very meticulous. And that's what I love about it. Um, all right. So let's uh, highlight a few performances here. We talked about Kate Siegel. And I think this was the first time. Like, I like Hush a lot. But this was the first time I was like, mm, Kate Siegel's really good. I thought she she turned out an excellent performance in Hill House, too. Um, she, she, yeah, she's no joke. She's She's got the goods. Yeah, and I think it's the, uh, you know, and people have highlighted this in other places, but it's the, you know, the big speech she has at the end about what, what is, what happens after you die, you know, uh, one of the big questions that this show asks and answers, um, but that whole speech is, uh, and, and Flanagan has, has cited the Carl Sagan pale blue dot. As, as something that informs his his sort of idea of what spirituality is and so forth and it, i felt like it was very much that but she just delivers it so well and and likewise the scene where she she answers the same question mm -hmm. only it's from the perspective of her unborn child I think is just an incredibly emotional scene one of, again one of a handful of moments where you know, it was like Niagara Falls, Frankie. I was, I, I got real choked up in that scene because I thought that was just, you know, a beautiful writing married to a beautiful uh, performance. Well, I think that that discussion that she had with Riley was beautiful on several levels. Uh, and the fact that they're, they both had their own individual ideas of death and what death should bring 
uh, from their point of view. And the fact that it played out that way for each of them, I think is a beautiful thing, you know, and it, it just highlights the fact that everyone has a different experience in life and everyone has different expectations. And I like the idea that it's going to be different for everyone. And I, I think that, you know, in the end, Riley got the, he got the, the, the satisfying ending that he needed and wanted. And so did Aaron. And, uh, it just, Oh my God, it was beautiful. I love that. I love that when she's describing death for her daughter, you know, what death is like for her daughter and then the death for her was a very different thing, but they both are, I, I think, suit the needs of the individual. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, and all right. So, uh, I thought that was great. I thought, uh, Rahul Coley as the sheriff, I thought he was very good. He was, he was kind of a, an anchor character for the show where he's very, very steadfast, very, um, wounded in his own way for sure, but is very much a, uh, you know, uh, like a, a really, uh, kind of stoic and, and fixed character for most of, of the show. Um, I think that's another thing that Stephen King does quite often too, with his law enforcement characters yeah. or his characters in authority, which tend to be in his works, law enforcement, you know, uh, and they often have sort of, a uh, an, a peripheral, view of what's going on you know and then they sometimes play a bigger portion and sometimes not but i think that that was very stephen kingy of him but i loved it i i it's exactly i think what was called for i loved his character i loved his backstory and the, the fact that we got it and in such detail and his delivery of that was excellent as well uh, every character seemed to get their moment to shine, and the actors that he chose to do this all just nailed it. I love that part where he's talking to his son, and his son's like, "Hey, I want to go to church and see what this Christian thing's all about because you know stuff's happening, things are happening, miracles are happening." And the father's like, "That's not a miracle. That that's not what God does. God would not give somebody." Uh, a get out of jail free card or whatever and somebody else just as good just as nice just as worthy just say nah right yeah, yeah like there are they're... some frank discussions about religion in this that I great that I thought were really uh, you mentioned the word brave earlier and that might be oh that might be uh, overshooting it I don't know if I use it here but I, it's the it's the word that comes to mind I, I think that some of the the points that these characters made throughout this series like the, the discussions that Riley was having with Father Paul when he's just like you know don't tell me that you know basically no matter what I say you're gonna lean on the God works in mysterious ways you know and it I I was really really impressed with how those things were brought to the surface and so smartly it just my the thing i like about it was it was, it was very frank yeah absolutely neither on neither side or any of the sides was anybody too preachy and that includes the guy who was preaching i mean he had his moments where you know, a little bit of fire and brimstone but for the most part it wasn't heavy-handed but just as a very frank discussion on faith and belief and the differences of them and the similarities. How, you know, yeah, you got the Muslim guy going, no, we do believe in Jesus. We like Jesus. You know, we think he's a swell guy. And you can't take that away from us just because we have different opinions than you. So I just, I like that where it was just a very open and frank, honest. It yeah. was very honest and it felt honest and I think that's the most important thing is that each of these points of view from each of these characters came across as genuine. And even probably our biggest villain of the piece in my mind is Bev. Oh yeah. But I, even for sure, yeah, yeah. But even she wasn't mustache twirling. I mean she was a bad egg to begin with. And that's why I'm glad at the very, very end she's like the one person who's trying to escape her fate and she still doesn't do it, so you know, screw you. 
But uh, <laughs> but even while she was very, very much cut from a Stephen King cloth, it wasn't as heavy-handed as other portrayals of that particular archetype from Stephen King stories. I mean, there was some of that. There was some of that exceptionalism and some of that art I perfect. But it was you know, again. She wasn't as bad as Mrs. Carmody. I don't think. She right. wasn't that far gone. Yeah, I yeah, I totally agree. I and uh she actually was the friend in Hush which it, it, Oh, like, I didn't know that. Yeah, she's almost unrecognized. Her. Yeah. In this she she's so totally different. Um and yeah, uh the guy who plays Riley in fact. What is his Oh, name? he was Zach the killer Gilford. in Hush, wasn't he? No, no, no. That was John Gallagher Jr. Oh, okay. okay. Zach Guilford, I think, was on Friday Night Lights, I think was his big thing, which I never oh, watched. No, but no, I didn't either. Yeah, but that... I know I've seen him from something. I, I recognize him from something. Yeah, I mean, he was terrific. Like you said, everybody kind of gets their own monologue in this. And his... his uh, when he's talking to Father Paul about how he views his alcoholism... And how it it he describes it as there being a saboteur inside him, and that he just has to keep that saboteur locked away because, given a little bit of sway, that saboteur that lurks under his skin will, you know, will will put him in situations like the one that got him locked up. Uh, but it'll ruin his life. It'll ruin the lives of people around him. And it's a really interesting take on. Um, what addiction is, is is that part of you that is doing everything in its, its power to fuck up your life. Almost like how uh, Dexter describes it as the dark passenger, Mm, you know, it's that, it's that other, that other part of you that if you allow it to take control, will fuck everything up. And I really like the discussion that he had with Father Paul when he was basically saying that, you know, the the leaning on God allows you to basically not take responsibility for your actions. And then Father Paul's response to that, that whole that whole discussion was, I I think, incredible. And him introducing the uh, what is it is the AV? I, I don't remember what the the acronym was or the the initials were his the alternate rr oh rr yeah, yeah right for pirates aa for pirates yeah <laughs> yeah right it's uh yeah rational recovery i yes, think is what yeah. that is yeah yeah i thought that was interesting too i i like to see i like seeing the both sides of that coin and the and the the two different ways that you can approach something like that yeah i i really I uh, thought that was great. Um, I thought the uh, Annabeth Gish, I thought was great in this as well. Mm-hmm. And and speaking of those moments of of you know fine writing, there is the conversation that Aaron has following the death of Riley, where she goes to Annabeth Gish, and some of again the Stephen Kingiest writing in all of this is. Aaron saying, now that I hear myself tell you what's happening, I, mm-hmm. I've got to be crazy. And Annabeth Gish says, well, you know, since we're we're talking about crazy among friends here, let's yeah. just go. Let me show you crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's just go full tilt fucking bonkers. And I, I like that scene a lot. I mean, there. Yeah. It, it's just a, a lot of great moments. And, and Mike Flanagan kind of serving up uh some some pop flies to these actors who are able to kind of sink their teeth in into these moments like Henry Thomas has that great moment where he kind of confesses his frustration with Riley and and how difficult it's been for him to kind of love him as a, as a son and um and since, Riley's like I'm glad we're having this is yeah <laughs> yeah but but you know that the, yeah, and maybe this is where we get a little bit more in, into the themes because we've been dancing all around it. But um, there is that sense of these are all decent people who are being healed 
at the same time that they're being poisoned. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, that's such an interesting dichotomy, but um, you know, we've talked a, a, a lot about the religion and I, I think this is, and I think Flanagan himself has, has put it this way that a lot of this show is him having a conversation with himself through all these different characters that all have a different take on what religion is and what it means and what the, what faith is, is supposed to be. And it, and it asks these giant questions of not only what happens after you die, which we get, you know, several answers to that question, but also what does it mean to have faith? And we get a lot of answers to that question, too, based on all these characters. Like, we have Sheriff Hassan, who is very sure in his faith, but also believes that exploring the path to God is important, but has his reservations about it uh, when it comes to his son. But, uh, you know, and that sits alongside Father Paul, who is almost blind in his in the firmness of his belief and what the power of faith is and which sits alongside Bev's belief that faith is a tool that you can use to, to kind of either get your own ends or, you know, fashion the world as you see it should be. Um, and, and Riley who has no faith at all. And Aaron who sits somewhere in the middle of all that, where she believes in something, but isn't quite sure what it is. And, um, yeah, I don't know of another show I've ever seen that kind of presents that gamut of ideas and doesn't really pass judgment on it other than to kind of ultimately say, I think that that it is an individual choice and that, you know, the, the faith that makes the most sense to you so long as it doesn't cause the destruction of a small fishing village is probably <laughs> the right one. Right. Yeah, I think that directly ties into what the each of them each of their views on what happens when we die. I, I think that faith is just as individual as that. And that's the way I see faith. Like I I recognize all the different faiths that people have and I think that they're all legitimate in their own way. And whatever people find comfort in i don't see a problem with that as long as you're not you know causing the destruction of a small fishing village you know or hurting other people in the pursuit that's of the that big faith. one for me believe what you want don't hurt people that should be the universal faith do your own thing be happy find what works for you just don't hurt other people don't wage no holy wars don't you know well, we got to burn them because they're different than us and all that. Just crap. Just do what works for you. Just leave other people alone to do what works for them. I think it's something I've, you know, as a function of getting older, uh, you know, they say there are no atheists in foxholes and what is uh, getting older but diving into a foxhole. Yeah. Um, it's something that I've thought a lot about and... Uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is exactly that I believe. And I, and I think that for a lot of people, that last monologue that Kate Siegel has, I think has resonated with a lot of people because there is something really, really simple about the idea that, Hey, we are, um, we are essentially, you know, the stuff of stars that, you know, briefly shines and then returns to, uh, the, you know, <laughs> returns to dust, returns to that that stuff of stars. Um, and maybe the the line I think that resonated most with me was, uh, "We are the cosmos dreaming of itself mm -hmm. uh, over and over and over again." Yeah, and it, it's it's such a beautiful idea. I and it, there. You know, God bless her. Uh, my girlfriend had a great line, uh, and she's much more religious than than am I. But um, you know, I at some point we were talking about uh, the difficulty of um, helping someone who is an addict, 
uh, because she works on a lot of behavioral nursing and stuff. And she said, but that's where God is. God is in the hard stuff. And it was something that really stuck with me. And watching this show, I returned to that idea a lot of of this notion that that whatever spirituality there is out there, um, that it isn't it isn't always easy and it, it isn't always convenient. And in fact, it's in the, the difficult moments that it becomes necessary, or at least that's where that that's where the, the greatest benefit is. And, uh, and I, I again, I just, I, I think that a show that not only bothers, but dares to, to say, Hey, here's what I think happens when you die from a, a number of different perspectives and I don't think it's as wishy-washy as, well, I don't know. You guys can figure it out. I think it has a perspective, but I think part of that perspective is an inclusiveness that you don't often you don't often see in day-to-day life. No, sadly, there's too many bevs in the world. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's the moral of the story. Too many bevs. Um <laughs> <laughs> But I, you know, we talked about that. We talked about uh, the, uh, our, you know, themes of both religion and addiction. And I think the other, the other overarching theme of this is, uh, is is redemption. You know, like everybody has their redemption arc to one degree or another in this story. Um, and I, I think that even when that redemption is interrupted, like Riley's is, I think the show and Mike Flanagan himself has a lot of affection for people who are trying to make themselves and the world better. Well, he even pretty much straight out says it with through father Paul, when, when Paul first introduces himself to Riley and he's like, Oh, I'm, I'm not so much in good graces right now. And then he's like, well, that's, you know, that's, those were Jesus' favorite people. We can work with that. You know, yeah. we can work with that. We Those are the ones that the people who are, they don't need it. You know, <laughs> they don't need the work. You know, they, they and obviously I don't, I really don't think that there are that, there are no perfect people. That's kind of the whole point But uh, of, but if. But there are some people worse off than others. Absolutely. And it's the people who are worse off that need it the most. It, it, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's, and he straight out says that. And I I find it interesting that everyone, I feel like everyone in this show gets a redemption at one point, including Sturge even like I, I always, I felt bad for his character because he, he clearly had a good, you know, he saved, he saved Howie because he was nice to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, he he was always nice to me, you know, so he saved him and I thought that was a very sweet moment. Um but everyone has a redemption except for Bev who in the end is I mean she is so steadfast in her belief though even to the end I I feel that she is still steadfast in her faith but she is attempting to run from what she knows is coming mm-hmm. you know she she knows that it's it basically it's hellfire and as she would view it and she doesn't she doesn't reach that moment where she's ever sorry for what she's done or she ever realizes that what she's done is wrong instead she tries to hide from it well that, instead of standing there and taking it like with the bravery of a martyr she runs Exactly. Well, and there's that moment where she goes to the beach where she sees, you know, the sheriff and, and his son praying. And there there's a glimmer there where she uh, when she's standing on the shore and, and kneels down, you're like, OK, well, she's reached some point of acceptance. But then she, like her true nature comes out. Yeah. Right. And she starts digging in the sand to try to save herself. Uh, at the last possible moment, while everyone else in town is singing a hymn. Yeah. Well, together, you think that you, know? you think that she's going to like at the moment when she drops to her knees, it's almost as if she's about like, like she's supplicating, like she like she's a, a like she's gonna you. There is like a, a glimmer of hope there that she's going to then just throw herself at the mercy 
of the God that she has so much faith in. But instead, <laughs> then she starts digging like a mad woman. And my response to that was, well, if you had thought of that sooner, <laughs> you probably would be okay. But um, it's, it, and it's a desperation. A, uh, I, mean, I think she's <laughs> digging a literal foxhole right there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, yeah. Another one of those moments where I'm like, Mike Flanagan saw the movie thirst. Um, <laughs> But I, I also think it's telling that in that scene where the church all goes crazy and everybody's eating everybody and drinking poison and all that. She hides. Yeah, what'd she do? She ran and hide. Yeah. She, hide. she ran and hid. So, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know about the strength of her convictions. She doesn't have any. Yeah, I th- yeah, I think that's right. I hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but I think you're absolutely right that that, that is, it reveals her to have no faith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and yeah, I mean, in the end, she has she has a I think she has a belief, you know, in that she believes what she is saying. I think she but found I think her, she has a lack of faith. I you know? think she found herself in this role, and for whatever reason, it suited her and it fit her, and it gave her some sense of being. But yeah, I don't believe she believed any of it. To her, religion was nothing but a cudgel to use to beat people over the head. Well, that's true too, but yeah, it, yeah. In the end, it, the as a matter of faith, she clearly doesn't have any because you know she attempts to hide at the moment when she has been preaching it up. You know, this mm-hmm. is going to be amazing. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be everything you ever wanted it to be. Let me go hide here in the back room so I don't get hurt. Yeah. Um, and then you know, in the end, rather than succumbing to to like giving herself over to God like you would expect someone to do, then she again attempts to hide from it. So she doesn't really have any faith in her convictions. She doesn't really, and it's, oh, she can that's quote, why her character yeah. is so frustrated. That's she, why I say she's the one, she's the worst villain of the piece. Yeah, she can quote scripture, chapter and verse, but doesn't really believe any of yeah. it. Yeah. It's all, it's all a, a means to an end. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, we've talked a lot about this. Uh, let, let's get to some final thoughts here. Um, I, I'm going to steal a little bit of thunder by saying my, my my complaints with the show. The reason I only give it I only give it a measly four and a half stars, guys, um, is because I do. Thankful. I know. I <laughs> I do think there are uh, like Mike Flanagan. God bless him. Loves to hear himself right. And I would say 95% of the time I'm totally with him. I think there are a couple of moments in this that get a little didactic. Um, not necessarily with the religion stuff, but I think that some of the monologues feel a little a little less organic than other ones do. Um, it, it's a really minor complaint. There's probably two or three moments in all seven plus hours where I'm like, eh, I think that didn't quite hit the right uh, note. Um, and I do think that with such a sprawling story as this one, uh, I wish that we had maybe understood a little more uh, about Sheriff Hassan. Like, I understand the backstory and so forth, but I, I don't know. I almost wanted a little more with that character. Not that uh, I thought the character was bad, and certainly I think the performance is great. Um, I just wish there had been more of him. I wish he had played a greater role in things, I suppose. Uh, but that's a really a personal minor complaint when you're looking at the the scope of this piece. And, and I was continually impressed by it and, and really captivated by it. But uh, what, what about you guys? Some, uh, some final thoughts out of, out of use. The only problem I have this, and it's a minor one, is the vampire at the end. I thought he sh- they should have shown him dying. I thought that would have paid off uh, her sacrifice at the end where she's letting him feed off her just so he can shred her wings. But then when it's all said and done, he just gets up and flies away. Granted, he's flying a little awkward, but he's still flying away. So I just that wasn't as satisfying as it could have been. They should have had him fly, and he just couldn't. And then had him run, and you know, like like a coward, go looking for a place to hide, and then burn his ass up in the sun. That's what I would have done. Yeah. But you know, 
I'm not Mike Flanagan, so what the hell do I know? But, uh... <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, again, this it's real easy to throw rocks at the at the windows of, you know, the dude who has, has made some money. Like, you compared him to Carpenter, and, and I have as well. I think, I read somewhere somebody said that he might be the new Frank Darabont, but I think Mike Flanagan has too much of a mean streak to be a <laughs> Darabont, because he... Yeah. You know, again, the happy ending of this is a girl is crippled again. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, everybody dies. Now they die singing Kumbaya or something, but they all die. Yeah. But so that's why I think they should have shown the vampire. I mean, that just would have been perfect. That you could have, at least for me anyways, I could have bought the whole sacrifice of the entire town more if just that evil, nasty thing was for sure dead. And just having him fly off and go, well, I doubt he's going to make it, that's not enough. He deserved to die. If the entire town dies, he deserved to die. Yeah. What, I, I, uh, what if you looked at Aaron's sacrifice uh, a little more directly as a Christ allegory in that she gave of herself, she sacrificed her life, with the assumption that things could turn out well, but there is a definite lack of certainty. Whereas if you look at at Christ giving himself over, he did that for, from the Christian point of view, he did that for the people of the world, but then what they do with it from that point on, he has no control over. So it may be for nothing. Yeah, I get that, but there's enough other evils in the world that one at least should have been squashed. Yeah, I, just, I, I was gonna play devil's advocate and say what Jamie did, but that's totally what it would have been. I'm, I'm still in the the Brian camp on this one of like, hey, he should have died. And yeah. Like the whole town sacrificed themselves. We sh and it should be for a reason. We we should have seen that reason. But again, it's uh, you know, good lord, what a what a, a small flaw. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's that's really the only quibble i have with it so that's why i gave it a five you know it's i think it's damn near perfect one thing yeah. i do wish that they had explored a little bit more and this is kind of uh piggybacking off of you Bo, is when you were mentioning the sheriff is is it's it's i think heavily alluded to his faith being directly tied to his wife and i, I think the reason that he is so even though he is open-minded and is all about the exploration of other religions, ultimately he wants his son to, to live in their faith. And I, I think that that is because he, his faith is so strongly tied to his wife who is no longer with him. And I do wish that they had focused a little, just a little bit more on that to kind of drive that point home. Um, if that's all, if that is even the, the even if that's even the point, and I'm not reading too much into it, you know. But on the other hand, if that is what he was trying to say, and I did see it, then I guess I saw it with what we got. So it, it doesn't, you know. Uh, I, I do though wish that his that his view of faith had been explored just a little bit more. And then, and I, and at the same time, you know, I, I feel like it was, you know, we we saw them pray a lot. We. We had the whole meeting about it. We had, you know, them dying together at the end in prayer, you know, so it definitely, it's not like he ignored it, but I do think that that was a rich character and I would have liked to have seen a little more from him. Sure. I could have also used like half an episode of Vampire Hunters, Vampire Hunting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that's honestly, and I know that it really, in, in the scope of the story, it really doesn't matter because about the the vampire himself you know because ultimately what matters is that father paul or i guess uh, monsignor sees him as an angel um but I, I would have been interested to know a little bit more about that creature you know i mean sure. the first thing i thought of when we were watching it is the uh the lamia the Persian. Oh yeah. That, you know, that, that was what I was thinking of. But it would, as soon as he went into the cave, that was actually, I turned to Brian. I was like, what's that L word? <laughs> uh, no, I no, I didn't. I was like, what's that? I was like, what do you call, what do you call that vampire from? And I couldn't use my words. Cause you know, Bo, you, you're very well versed in the yeah, fact yeah. that I don't always, 
I'm all, not always able to use my head brain, but I was just like, you know, I was like, what's that P word, that P word for the area, the place. And he's like, <laughs> Persia? I'm like, okay, yes. All right. So what is the Persian vampire lore? What is that called? And he's like, Alamia? I'm like, that, 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 that's that, that, that's what's in that cave. <laughs> yeah, you, the, the two things you're bound to run into there, uh, Lamias and Wishmasters. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, all right. Well, look, guys, uh, anything else before we wrap this up? Uh, and, and I tell you, thank you yet again for taking the time to do this because uh i i needed to have this conversation and i i could not have picked two better people because it was uh just as in-depth and esoteric as i had hoped uh well i mean we honestly this is something that i could talk about for the length of the runtime if not more there are so many things that we didn't explore that we didn't get into but obviously we we did the broad strokes we, we talked about, the, I think, the most important themes and elements here. But there are so many things that I'm sure that there are people out there who have watched it are going, but you didn't talk about this, you know. And we saw them. We, we, <laughs> we know. Uh, but it's just there's so much. I love the island of feral cats. Oh, yeah. I, want, I told Brian I, wanted, I would love an island of cats. I like uh, also Flanagan hates cats. Yes. From, uh, judging <laughs> yeah. from Hill House and this, he has a real problem with cats, and that hurts my feelings. I, I like that Lisa, when they invite her, like, hey, do you want to go smoke pot on the cat island? She's like, nah, <laughs> I don't want to smell like cat piss. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of, okay. I'm really okay with not smelling like cat piss. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, ooh, cats. And then we get there, and it literally is an island of cats, which is just like my, that's my nirvana right there. <laughs> That is what happens when I die. <laughs> My electrons dance along feral cat's fur. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, where can people hear more out of you? Because God knows they'll want to. Um, uh, well, we do Horror in the House of Salmons, and you can find that on, well, pretty much any place that you can find podcasts. All you got to do is search for Horror in the House of Salmons, and we'll be there. S A M M O N S. Um, that's right. And you can also find us on Facebook uh, at the Facebook group page. Not surprisingly, Horror in the House of Salmons. Yeah, it's kind of a thing we do. Yeah, and and Brian, I would be remiss not to uh, urge you to uh, pimp a little bit of your editing and writing material. Oh. Why? Thank you. Uh, most recently, I am doing a book called Tales from Arkham Sanitarium. It's coming out from Dark Regions Press. It's all about the madness in the Lovecraftian uh, Cthulhu mythos type stories. And most recently, just the other day, from the Chaosium, who does the Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game. You know, think of D&D, but, you know, Lovecraft monsters. Uh, they are releasing a campaign I wrote years ago it, this baby's been a long time coming and it's finally coming out now a campaign is basically think of a a big like a novel it's uh 400 some pages it's one big adventure broken up into six different chapters and uh we had some test players they all loved it everybody seems to think it's pretty neat oh and so do i and it's called a time to harvest so, if you roll the funny-looking dice and you want to battle some eldritch horrors, give that a look. Call of Cthulhu, A Time to Harvest. And that's coming out on in hardback when? Later. Uh, probably at the uh, beginning of next year. Right now it's in PDF, so it's in an electronic format. But they're doing a good thing. I didn't even know they did this, but I like it. If you buy the PDF, when the hardback comes off, comes up, they will give you a coupon for the price of the PDF to take off the hardback. So you're not actually losing money. Yeah, um, you cool. can't afford not to buy it with, with that kind of arrangement. Yeah, so that's my most latest things, and thank you for asking. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, we'll uh, wrap things up here on the back end. Uh, thanks again uh, to Brian and Jamie Sammons. And, uh, uh, boy, uh, you, you ought to watch Midnight Mass. I think that's the real moral of the story. Oh, yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah, if you haven't, well, we just spoiled the shit out of it for you. But <laughs> Another win for Mikey Flanagan. Good on him. <laughs> yeah. 
and there you have it, folks. Uh, what I thought was a terrific discussion of Midnight Mass with two people I adore. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, and last uh, but not least, here's a couple of pitches uh, for some Legion podcast business. Uh, in a few short days, on October 1st, we are beginning the 31 Days of Halloween uh, that on LegionPodcast.com where uh, every day, if you are a subscriber to the Legion podcast feed, then you will be getting uh, a new movie, a discussion of a new movie every every ding-dong day uh, for all 31 days of October, leading to Halloween, of course. Uh, I will be doing that. There is some other stuff that other podcasters in the uh, Legion Collective are going to be doing. So I encourage you to drop by legionpodcasts.com and subscribe on the podcatcher of your choice. We're everywhere, uh, Audible and uh, Spotify and iTunes and all that stuff. So uh, subscribe and you'll get this and many, many other things uh, from myself and other podcasters. And uh, look for some new stuff. We've got a, a couple of new shows coming out in October, one of them being The Heart of Horror with myself and Kate Pollock talking about uh, our horror films in relation to uh, relationships and and love and and that kind of thing. So um, and hopefully taking some of your questions. So we we sincerely hope that you're going to uh, take part in that show. And a, a, a new show out of me that I I'm not going to quite talk about just yet, but it's going to be uh, quite good. I think I hope. So that's it for now. Thanks for listening. Uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for uh, for subscribing to the YouTube channel. Um, YouTube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. And yeah, a lot of stuff is coming. So uh, hang tight. Uh, the Halloween season is upon us. And we are certainly going to descend upon it like so many uh, winged monsters. That's it. Have a great day. Have a great Halloween season. And we will talk to you very, very soon here on Legion Podcasts. 